I saw a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and in the sight of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. Words taken from the Apocalypse of St. John. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Andaman Islands are located some 12,000 miles off the coast of India. These Andaman Islands have a population of some 350,000 people. And you may remember the Andaman Islands because a few years back, those islands were so close to the epicenter of a massive Asian earthquake that a giant wave or tsunami hit them almost immediately. Some of the tribes on these islands are most primitive, and they fiercely resist all contact with the outside world. Helicopters that were sent to provide relief after that tsunami, for example, were greeted with a hail of blow darts. These Andaman tribes can trace themselves back 2,000 years ago. And to this day, they live the exact same type of life as their ancestors. So primitive and still undeveloped, the Andaman peoples have no agriculture, but they're still hunter and gatherers. And Andaman tribesmen from the time of Christ, therefore, could easily fit in to his descendants today because there has been absolutely no development in their way of life or culture. Now, although very traditional, the Roman Catholic Church is not exactly like the Andaman tribes. Our Holy Mother, the Church, has developed organically, naturally through the centuries. Her doctrine, moral teachings, customs, liturgy, and devotions have developed over time. Ancient Christians, therefore, would note some differences if they had been brought forward in time to, say, the Middle Ages or the Catholic Reformation or the time of Pope St. Pius X. But these same ancient Christians brought forward in time would also have noted a definite connection with the past, that the changes and differences showed a natural growth, an organic development, like a small child growing into a man. In another way, however, the church throughout the centuries has been like the Andaman tribes, for the church loves her past. She loves her apostles. She loves her church fathers, her church doctors, her customs, and all her devotions of the past. The church then seeks to develop a partnership between the old and the new, a generational connection, if you will, between ancestors and descendants. As one person put it, there needs to be a partnership between the dead, the living, and the unborn. Again, a partnership needs to be there between the dead, the living, and the unborn. This generational connection is so important, so vital to the life of the church. Catholics today are called to have the greatest respect for the past, all while offering our own little contribution and then passing on this great patrimony, this heritage, to our spiritual descendants. But if anyone sought to break this connection, it would be tragic and it would be most damaging to the church. It would mean that the saints of old had somehow a different faith or a different Catholicism than we do today. Now, the progressive Catholic or the modernist Catholic has sought such a break. Such a person looks with disdain upon the church of the past. Somehow the church and her members were only enlightened in the 20th century. They want a future church a future church disconnected from the saints of old. 
they arrogantly speak about singing a new church into being, a church that will meet the needs of modern men who have evolved. If a man has evolved, then the teachings of the church have to catch up, evolve, even to the point of an essential change in church teachings in terms of their meanings. Only that which is new has a right to be heard, whereas the teachings and faith of the saints must be suppressed. In a world which prides itself on letting voices be heard, we have silenced the voices of the saints to such an extent that we have to wonder if we still have the faith of our fathers. G.K. Chesterton, the famous Catholic journalist, once wrote the following about tradition and the importance of allowing our ancestors to be heard. Chesterton wrote, quote, Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. Chesterton then continues with a great line. Tradition is the democracy of the dead. Tradition is the democracy of the dead. Because tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about alive. Unquote. In other words, as Catholics, we have the right to have the saints of old present at every church council and at every church synod. Again, tradition is the democracy of the dead. And our Catholic fathers who have gone before us should always have a vote. Now, Father Frederick Faber, I think many of us are familiar with him. He was a 19th century oratorian priest, and he was a writer of many hymns, including that famous song, Faith of Our Fathers, in which we hear that repeated phrase, Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. But the ancient faith of the saints, it seems, is now up for a vote. And the saints are not allowed into the ballot box to cast their votes. Many modern churchmen look to compromise on doctrine and moral teaching, supposedly using a more democratic method, these modern churchmen take polls and they look to build consensus and they present us with confusing, ambiguous, unsound and novel statements that we've never heard before. Seeing which way the wind is blowing, they look only to respond to the needs of the present moment without seeking any contribution from the saints of old. And why is this? Because they want a new church. A church separated and disconnected from the old. The Orthodox faith, therefore, is now seen as an extremist version of Catholicism. But this democratic method, where the voices of the saints are silenced, is nothing but a tyranny a tyranny of the now, a tyranny of the present moment, where only current positions on doctrine and morality are considered valid. This totalitarian tyranny has embraced the errors of Russia in order to force a change in thinking, in language, and meaning of church teachings. And since so many Catholics have become clueless in regards to the faith of the saints, many accept the new statements coming forth, even if they are in direct contradiction to the faith of our fathers. And this brings us to the recent event known as the Synod on the Family. One Catholic newspaper columnist suggested that the Synod on the Family, at least in 2014, was rigged. 
It was manipulated. It was fixed. These gatherings, these modern synods, are not so much about teaching the holy faith and the truths of morality, but rather in gaining a consensus, giving consent to revolutionary ideas that would have caused the holy saints to tear their garments and cry out blasphemy. The modern synods can now be packed with various groups, including the most extreme liberals and modernists within the church. They gather to deal with pastoral matters. But once the synod is over, their pastoral suggestions will become like new doctrine that you have to believe. Woe to those who go against the party platform. Russia, again, has certainly spread her errors. Ideological agents are in areas of great influence, and they will seek to move the membership of the church in a direction towards things which are totally foreign to Catholicism. Synods have become temporary gatherings of a Catholic Kremlin with spokesmen who sound like Big Brother from George Orwell's 1984. And for the majority of the Catholic press, they become a willing tool like Pravda. How would the saints respond today to this perversion of Catholic doctrine and moral teachings? The great theologian of the 5th century, St. Vincent Lerens, provides the answer. He said, Quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus creditum est. In English, St. Vincent said, We must hold that which has been believed everywhere by all and always. The same theologian, St. Vincent Lorenz, also stated, quote, The nature of the Catholic faith is such that nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away from it. Either it is held in its entirety or it is rejected totally, unquote. And for those revolutionary thinkers back in his time who sought to compromise or change the faith, St. Vincent Larens wrote, quote, God commands us to believe an unchanging faith. We do not innovate anything. How is it that novelties are introduced which were never even thought of by our predecessors, unquote. In short, then, church teachings, whether in doctrine or morality, should have the exact same meaning today as they did back then. On this great feast of all saints, we have to ask this question as Catholics. Do we, by and large, have the faith of our fathers? The same content of the faith the same deposit, the same apostolic faith? Or would we rather have a new church that does not refer to the teachings of the saints, a church which does not allow the dead to vote? Modernist tyrants want a new church and a new faith. They want a new start from zero. They want a new beginning. We're even Vatican II documents, and the writings of John Paul II are considered Passé. We are dealing here not just with a crisis of faith. We are also dealing with a crisis of saints. Where are the saints today who will hold the faith of our fathers? St. Teresa of Jesus once said, One man and God make an army. Adam's faithful son named Seth lived in the mountains with himself and his family in order to remove himself from the ungodly men who lived in the valley. Noah and his family alone remained pure in a time of tremendous impurity, and they were saved through the wood of the ark. Abraham rejected idolatry, and he worshipped the one true God in the true religion, and he became our father in faith. 
Again, we need saints. Saints who have the true faith, of course, but also men who are in the state of sanctifying grace. We can't do much without grace. In fact, we cannot do anything without grace. We need men who seek virtue. Men who not only read blogs and newspapers, but also read the sacred scriptures and the lives of the saints and the spiritual classics. Men who meditate and have an interior life. Such men, and only those men, will keep the faith and they will live the faith in these dark and confusing times. Such men will not compromise, but rather resist anything that is not in line with traditional doctrine and morality. In conclusion, St. Maximus the Confessor was one of the Church's most profound theologians back in the 7th century. As a theologian, St. Maximus the Confessor taught against those who sought to compromise the faith for the sake of political and religious unity. While others were looking to change doctrine or be ambiguous, St. Maximus the Confessor clearly stated that Jesus Christ was the incarnate Son of God, fully God, fully man, with two complete natures and two wills, both a divine will and a human will, because that was the orthodox faith. Resistance to heresy at that time was virtually reduced to one man, St. Maximus the Confessor. For his stubborn, holy, stubborn confession of the Christ, the truth, St. Maximus was persecuted by the compromisers who wanted orthodoxy to somehow peacefully coexist with heresy. He will be put on trial three times. And seeing that St. Maximus the Confessor would never compromise one inch on the faith, his persecutors had his right hand cut off and his tongue pulled out of his mouth so that he could no longer write nor speak about the uncompromising faith of our fathers. They sought to silence him. He was then sent off into exile where he soon died in the year 662 A.D. But 18 years later, the teaching for which he gave his life, the doctrine that the God-man Jesus Christ had two wills, divine and human, to go with his two natures, was confirmed and vindicated at a church council. St. Maximus's faithfulness in the midst of a crisis of faith was rewarded both in this world and in the next. The crisis of faith is partly a crisis of saints. Where are they? Only if we grow in holiness can we possibly overcome this time of trial. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.